the point of this video is today a, a reaction to Dr. Gavin Ortland, who has uh, recently done done just a fun little short on the visible church. Yeah. Which obviously, you know, Gavin can explain in 50 seconds or less. So we thought maybe we would uh, expand a little bit on, on that yeah. con, uh, concept and really just talk about what it means to be the visible church. So. One of the biggest caricatures of Protestantism is that we don't believe in a visible church. Have you heard this? People say, Christ founded a visible church with a particular hierarchy, not just an invisible church of all believers and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, this is just it's one of those areas we can make progress in our dialogue. We all agree that the church is visible. The Protestant position isn't that the church isn't visible. It's that uh, we distinguish between a visible and invisible aspect of the church, just like St. Augustine did. In other words, there's a church as God sees it, which is all of the people who actually are united to Christ by faith, not including the hypocrites who are baptized, you know. And then there's the uh, visible church, which is the people who are baptized. So in distinguishing those, we're not denying one or the other. We're affirming both. We're simply distinguishing them. The real Protestant position is that we don't restrict the church to one institution. You know, there's maybe only two or three other people out there, I think, that, that are, are just worthwhile, that they're really trying to f find some explanation. Like uh, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, and Gavin Ortland. <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A couple others, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I thought, it, I thought it would be a kind of simple, easy thing to do at first, and then the more I thought about it, the more I realized there's more to this issue um, so I think what the way he starts his video is uh, in saying that, yes, Protestants do believe in a visible church. And I think that's kind of funny because it struck me as being that must be the evangelical Protestant version of what we Orthodox experience when people come up to us and say, why do you guys worship icons? And you know, we just have to shake our head and say, we don't worship icons. Like, yes, you do. And it's like, if we say we don't worship icons, we know what we're doing, we don't worship icons. So just drop it, leave it at that, take our word for it. We're the ones who are doing what we're doing, so we should know. And I think it's pro that's probably the same thing for evangelical Protestants. People, I don't know, any Orthodox maybe, but and maybe Catholics, or I don't know who, but people might come up and say, you guys don't believe in the visible church. It's like, yes, we do. It's like, well, no, I don't think so. And it's like, well, if we say we believe in the visible church, then we believe in the visible church. So you have to take that. So yes, they believe in the visible church. Uh, it, has to have certain, it has to have certain marks, um, as we know. I mean, obviously, this is the church of, we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. So, you know, you have to worship Jesus Christ as uh, God and Messiah and uh, king of the new Israel, the true, the true Messiah that has come and fulfilled the promises of God. Um, you know, so obviously you have to talk about people who are worshiping Jesus and believe in Jesus. So, I mean, that's one of the marks. And I think everybody would agree on that. But then we can get into different, um, more specific uh, marks. And, you know, if you look in the... Epistles of Paul, he mentions bishops um, and elders and deacons, and uh, so that's what we have. And I think, you know, if you're going to uh, be the visible church, then you have to have uh, bishops, you have to have a, a hierarchy, um, and I think that's, that's clear. Of course, people can argue about that, or at least how you have the hierarchy, but I mean, you know, that's, that's what we would say. Um, so, and then that is because the bishop presides over the congregation, and ultimately, we do all agree on that, even though some Orthodox might think we don't. They, they might be misled, it, and that is true, it happens. A lot, of, a lot of Christians, I think, not just Orthodox, but Catholics and even um, many Protestants think that the church has to be some sort of an institution or a building. Mm. Um, and, of course, that's not true. And none of the clergy, I think, of any of the churches believe that, but the people sometimes make this mistake at times. And so we all have to try to educate everyone that, no, the church is the congregation, it is the people. And it's the same for the Orthodox as it is for uh, Catholics or Protestants uh, or evangelicals or whatever. Um, 
The church is the congregation. So that is the visible church. When the people come together to worship God uh, through Jesus Christ, then that is the church. Okay. Um, so it's pretty simple. Sure. How much of that visibility is is part like there's there's a culture to it there's a yeah there's a calling to it right like isn't it, I mean, well, how is that part of yeah I think and I mean I think to kind of bring this back to um, Gavin's video too is that what is what is the visible church and if we both believe in the visible church if the Baptists or other evangelicals um, or Reform Protestants uh, to be maybe more specific believe in the visible church and the Orthodox Church believes in a visible church, then why is it that we look so incredibly different? Because we obviously <laughs> look very different. So we both believe in a visible church, but we do it in very different ways. And I think the best way to understand that is not in understanding any theology or sort of abstract kind of definition. It's not, that's not really what's happening. We really have to understand the devotional life I think for Orthodox to understand the devotional life of evangelical Protestants and to understand why their church looks the way that it does, they do believe in the visible church, but for them, they base that on their supreme devotional experience of salvation uh, by faith alone uh, as they see it. And, and for them, this is the ultimate expression of faith. This is their putting on a blindfold and walking a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. Um, this is their great show. They want to show God how much they love him and, and where their faith is, and they want to develop that faith and strengthen it. And so how do they do that? They want to strip away everything away. They, you know, no pope, no sacraments, no building. It's not, you know, the, the pope doesn't own my salvation. And I mean, you know, this is part of the reason why they, uh, these Protestant churches came into being. Um, because they thought that uh, Rome was a little overbearing in its use of authority. So the supreme act of faith is to just be just me and God, just my faith and God's grace, and I can feel the presence of, of Jesus, I can feel the Holy Ghost, I can feel the will of the Father. It's a personal, it's a very personal experience that relies on nothing else. And I think that's and that's, and that's very beautiful. That's a very beautiful devotion. And I think that Orthodox need that. Um, we, we do already have that, but I think maybe we should strengthen it. We need, to, we need to understand that our salvation does only come from God alone. It, we don't do a ritual and then suddenly we have salvation. It's not going to make up for uh, our heart. If our heart doesn't want the salvation, then... Nothing we can do makes up for that. I don't care how many bishops are in the room or how many priests are around. So, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a wonderful devotion, and I totally wholeheartedly endorse it. Um, and, but I think to flip it the other way, then how can an evangelical Protestant understand why the Orthodox Church looks the way it does? And I think it's for the same reason, although obviously it, it's, it's different. But this is our, this is our supreme devotional act. This is our putting on the blindfold and walking across the Grand Canyon, walking a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. Only what do we want to do? Uh, what we are doing is, is building the kingdom of God and making the kingdom of God as maximally visible as possible. This is our letting go and, and really relying on faith alone. And it, that might sound strange, well, then why do you build all these things? But that's, that, this is how we understand it. We build these huge cathedrals when we can, and we decorate them with all of these beautiful icons, and we have all of these beautiful vestments for our liturgy, and we have candles, and we have incense, and we have altars. And to think if there is no resurrection or there is no Jesus of Nazareth, then we've really made ourselves look like fools. But we've really gone out on a limb there, and that's how we show our faith, our surrender to God, um, is by being more visible, uh, is by uh, doing something like making an icon, um, making everything as visible as possible. 
what you are saying, I love what you're saying about affirming the devotional quality of mm. evangelical Christians and saying, yeah, yeah we, we believe in that too, yeah. but we want to do even more. Like we want to take our devotion and express yeah. it through all of this visible beauty. Yeah. Because I think, isn't, isn't that a piece of what you're talking about there is we want to make beautiful things that aid in our ascent into the heavenly realms through, through the liturgy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how much was, does beauty play a part in the visible church to your mind? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's not, I don't think it's a question of are you saved if your church isn't beautiful or you're not saved if it isn't beautiful. Um, and I think that's, that's where things get different. Um, I think in the evangelical churches, they're really focused on that moment of accepting salvation um, into your heart. And that's not what we're doing. We're saying, well, what do you do after you've accepted Jesus into your heart? Um, then what do you do? How do you build the kingdom after you've accepted uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as the king of the, of the Messianic Israel? Then what do you do? And in that case, um, again, beauty is, in making things maximally visible, uh, Beauty is important, as is truth and as is goodness, um, to be a little ancient uh, Greek f philosophy there. But, sure. um, <laughs> but beauty is now in the Christian church, it's not just a sort of abstract uh, virtue or ideal, um, but it becomes, all of these things become devotional. So that if you really love God, then you're not just going to make kind of a, sort of an icon you want it to make you want to make the most beautiful icon you can and if you're going to offer god worship you don't just want to well just kind of throw some prayers together and i don't know whatever um no we're going to think about this and we're going to try to structure this as much as we can and communicate as much as we can and in that sense serve truth and goodness as well as beauty but then also uh, you know, if we love God, then we will want to make it as beautiful as we can. And that's just, a, it's, 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 not, um, it's not a distraction that takes us away from salvation or away from faith or reliance uh, on God. What it is, is it's a devotional exercise. It's a devotional act in where we show uh, the depths of our love and the depths of our commitment and our gratitude to Jesus as our Savior. So do you think the difference then is kind of a minimalist approach versus a maximalist approach? I mean, I'm just by nature a maximalist. I just want yeah. more I think awesomeness so. all the time. <clears throat> I think the Reformed churches, or evangelical or whatever you want to call them, um, I, think they were, I think they were traumatized and they were demoralized mm. by their experience with Rome mm -hmm. in that uh, it seemed like they had to be minimalist. Because when uh, Rome would be a maximalist, visible church, they seemed to get it wrong. And then, you know, it really scared them. They thought, no, it, this, it, being maximally visible really seems, it seems to ah. lead to something bad. Well, I mean, I guess it did in the medieval so Roman we church. Don't, we don't trust all of this, right? Like, yeah. maybe, maybe that's the <laughs> Protestants have a trust issue. That yeah. all this stuff could lead us astray, kind of like people... Yeah. And it feels like it's, it's, it's intruding. Uh, you, you want a minimal church, a minimalist church, a minimally visible church if you're a Protestant because, you, because the most important thing is that experience of the grace of God, just you and God, yeah. the grace of God in your heart. You know, that is so important to just let go and fully open yourself to God in that way without any, you know, sort of distraction that... You know, nothing can interfere with that. That is the supreme core value of evangelical Protestantism. And like I say, I, I, I fully endorse that value. Wouldn't you say, though, in terms of orthodoxy, the monastics mm. really pick up that, yeah. that minimalist sort of devotional... I think so, especially the hermits. Yeah. You know, when, when you go to not even just being a monk, but being a hermit, it's just you in some stone cave or, you know, wooden Clo hut clothing somewhere. Clothing optional. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. No one's there to see you. Who cares? Um, you know, it's just you and a squirrel and a couple of birds <laughs> and some grass, and that's it. And a prayer so, rope. Yeah, and a prayer <laughs> and, and a prayer book and a Bible. You know, you have a prayer book and a Bible, but you know, um, but yeah, that's it. 
that's it. It's just you. And that, and that is, um, that is, I mean, that's a great, and I think for Orthodox people, we, I think a lot of Orthodox lay people are maybe a little frightened by what an evangelical Protestant would demand of them. Because it kind of sounds like, they're like, oh, you're trying to like force me to be a hermit. And that's scary. I'm right. not ready yeah. for that. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's something It's like, no, 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 we can, we can be. And it's important for Orthodox too to understand. It's like the hermits are there to, to, to give us an example. And we can do sort of a little bit of the hermit. You yeah. know, we can, we, and how do we do that? Well, it's like what evangelical Protestants do. We do need to have those times, even as Orthodox Christians, where we can go into a quiet room, maybe without an icon, most of the time, you know, we pray with icons and candles and all the rest of that. But sometimes it's good to, to go without that and to say, where am I? Is this really in my heart? Mm-hmm. Is this really in my heart? Mm-hmm. Do I know this? Do I mm-hmm. feel this? And I think that's very, that's very important. And then, hopefully, we say yes. Or we say, well, maybe not. Let's pray on it. Okay, okay now I do feel it. Okay, now I'm there. Once you get there... Well, then now you're back to where you have to be as an Orthodox, which is, well, now we have to go build the kingdom. And so now we have to make that maximally visible, mm-hmm. maximally beautiful, mm-hmm. uh, maximally truthful. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that is why we do, we do, uh, we are very concerned with doctrine, but we do know too that the doctrine of the common Christian, the doctrine of the everyday Christian, and that's me, uh, not necessarily just lay people. I'm no, I'm no great theologian. I, you know, I'm not a, a monk or a hermit or anything. I, you know, I'm just a regular guy in the world trying to live as a Christian. Um, I, do, uh, you know, I, I do have a special role in the church, but you know, living, living in a world where I have to have a job as well just to pay the bills, um, you know, how do we bring these incredible doctrines of the Trinity or the incarnation of Christ with all of their fine distinctions, how do we really live that? And the Orthodox have always sought to live that in the liturgy. It's the liturgy that teaches us all of these dogmas and doctrines. And it teaches us on a much deeper, more intuitive, uh, on a much deeper, more intuitive level. Um, Because we don't have the time to memorize a million you know, 12 syllable Greek words, you know, and then argue constantly back and forth. How do we just live it? How do we just live that reality and that truth that we know that the Orthodox Church has? And it's good that someone is out there who knows all those, you know, 12 syllable Greek words. That's great. But, um, But how do we just as normal people live that? And that is always in the liturgy. And I think that's an important thing too, because the liturgy is maximally visible and I think, I think some Protestants might say, well, we're maximally visible too. We let everyone see what we're doing. And, you know, we shout it from the, from the rooftops and the mountaintops. And, and uh, we let everyone know and invite people in. Um, but I think that <clears throat> now this is yeah, where it gets very interesting again is that we are maximally visible not just here and now, but we are bringing the church of a thousand years ago. We are still making that visible. Because that's what it means to make the entire church maximally visible. We need the church from a thousand years ago to be visible. We need the church from 2,000 years ago to be visible. And, this might blow your mind, but we need the church from 3,000 years ago to be fully visible in our worship. And we need the church from 4,000 years ago to be fully visible in our worship. The church from before time began, right? The pre-existent yeah. Christ. And even, the, and even that church, all the way through. Mm. Um, so yeah, we, we have to have... Our, we believe that if we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe that he is not just some new God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament was a big, bad old meanie and he's different, he's, he's actually a bad God. And Jesus is the true God. But no, it's the same God and everything is the same. Um, from Jesus to King David and King Solomon to Moses to Abraham, if that is all the same, then to Melchizedek, to Melchizedek, Abraham and Melchizedek. Yeah, if it's uh, if it's um, uh, Moses and Aaron, then it would be Abraham and Melchizedek um, as as the tandem there. But uh, so it's not just that we want Jesus to be visible and that we want the 
apostles to be visible and the history of the entire Orthodox Church from Jesus and the apostles to be visible, but also even, even, even the congregation of Israel um, under Moses and even the tiny congregation <laughs> under Abraham, that very first congregation of sometimes only two people maybe. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so that is what we have to make maximally visible as well. And that is why we don't change what we do. And that is why we still have churches that are basically based on the uh, structure of the sanctuary of Moses or the temple of Solomon and on the rituals of the Old Testament. Of course, people might say, well, then why aren't you killing bulls and goats? And it's like, well, because Jesus did away with all that. So, you know, we, we must bring Moses, Mo, the congregation of Moses must be visible, but it must reflect the teachings of Jesus Christ because it's through Jesus Christ that we receive salvation. So that's why that's different. 